Magandang hapon. Uh, anong oras na po? Ayan. So ako po ay nasa ora de peligro sa mga sandaling ito. Sapagkat uh, tinitingnan ko na sinisipat ko po ang aking mga kasama sa buluwagang ito at nakikita ko ang marami ang sumusulyap sa kanilang mga relo. <laughs> so na nangungusap na sana ay tapusin na natin yung session. <laughs> Uh, magandang hapo pong ulit at uh, I am deeply honored and humbled um, to share with you uh, the perspective of a nurse working with communities on how we can promote resilience in disasters. So I bring with me, uh, not actually stories, no, but experience of working with communities with my students, journeying with them on how we can raise their consciousness on what really matters most. Because in all of this, um, sessions, the bottom line is human lives. And we don't want to lose any life. And I think Dr. Labarde has uh, clearly uh, established that concretely through photos and experiences. So allow me, by the way, to focus on the concepts anchored on that reality. Hinga muna ko malalim. Sabi ko nga kanina mukhang nag-chest pain ako dito. Okay po, next slide please. So I am coming from... I'm coming from the perspective of public health, and we value collab. So we realize that we don't, we don't compete, rather we are here to complete and complement. And that's exactly the essence of what promoting disaster resilience, the RRM, is all about. You know, acknowledging our shared connections. So, moving forward, next slide please. I hope that uh, through the few minutes given to me, I can mainstream my advocacy over the last years, and that is essentially to help communities reach a critical consciousness that health, above all, should be a priority. So when we talk about the RRM, health should be a top agenda. So uh, I'll start with two questions to facilitate the discussion. First is, First, um, as a Filipino community, have we reached a collective consciousness that health is indeed number one? Siguro po, uh, bilang tugon dun sa tanong na yun, nais ko po ngayon lahat na tungayan ang sinasabi po ng Philippine Statistics Authority. Uh, it's tragic, no? That in the Philippines, in figures by the PSA 2018, they highlighted that among family expenditures, health maintenance is at even part of the top five, okay, where money goes at home. And this clearly uh, shows our values as a society that health, after all, is not number one. And I think that's also the reason why among nurses, and I know I have colleagues here who are now academicians, we are still struggling. We have our own, you know, battle to fight. And I think it's all rooted in the Filipino values and how we give premium to health. Now, tragic also in the sense that with these findings, there is a disconnect between how society views health and how we see opportunity uh, working abroad if you are a healthcare professional. So that disconnect is actually something that baffles me and probably the rest of those in the academe handling health sciences. Next slide, please. Um, to help us understand health in the context of disasters and promoting resilience, allow me, by the way, to invite everybody to revisit the evolving concepts of health because this is essentially the reason why disaster risk reduction must be mainstream, not just in the academe, but uh, in all aspects. So allow me to begin with the definition, next slide please, uh, of the World Health Organization, dating back to 1948. <laughs> so, wow! Isang libo, siyang Ilang dekada na ang lumipas, pero nananatiling makabuluhan ang nabanggit na definition. Ang sinasaan lang po nito, that health is a reality, in different dimensions, and it's physical, it's what's social, it's mental. Next slide, please. So, what essentially are the factors that influences 
people's health. So with that definition, let me cascade it down to something more concrete. So since health is a multidimensional reality, let's enumerate. So from the WHO perspective, we go into the Department of Health's version, dating back to 2007, when they enumerated six factors that influence health. And probably this can help us reflect on, are these factors going to increase the likelihood of casualties? Or are they supposed to mitigate the possibility of, you know, disaster impact. So let's look at them one by one. So first and foremost is politics. And I think Dr. Labarda has uh, mentioned that, that leadership and governance actually is crucial to DRRM. And in the context of health, politics is definitely, okay, number one. Why? Because we know very well that in our fragmented healthcare system, we have the national government and we have the local government. And the disconnect between these two agencies brings about health disparities. So even if the DOH sets the targets that this should be uh, okay, the programs in the context of SDGs and these are the targets, but if our local chief executives doesn't pick it, again, there's a gap. So again, politics is an important factor. Second, next please, okay, is to understand that culture shapes health-seeking behavior. And that's where, again, um, the weakness of our... Filipino mentality for health comes in. When do we usually seek health care? Kailan po ba tayo sumasangguni? Sa mga... Sumasangguni sa professional o sumasangguni sa mga hospital, sa ating health center? Kadalasan? Pag hindi na, kaya. And again, this spells out cause. Because the moment we seek health care, when signs and symptoms are already prominent, most likely, it's a case of complications. In the same manner, clinically, we know that when patients come in and they have chest pain, the underlying problem can be hypertension. And that hypertension could have been detected earlier if health is part of our consciousness, collective consciousness. Behavior, culture, health-seeking behavior is a factor. Third, please. Is understand that ano po bang tunay na pamana ng ating mga magulang na hindi mananakaw ni naman? Ano po? Oh, Academician sa mga kausap ko. So, ang sasagot natin, ano? Education. Uh, the real legacy of our parents are actually education. Because looking at public health and its realities, it's actually disease. Ang tunay na pamana ng ating mga magulang hanggang hukay sa iyo lang ay sakit. <laughs> And looking at epidemiology, Philippine epidemiology, we have recognized cardiovascular disease, diabetes, are all rooted in our family history. And that's part of these factors that complicates health, which can predict the likelihood of our DRRM efforts. Third, apart from heredity, fourth rather would be understanding, next slide, sorry, next, next bullet please, is understanding the role of the environment, which I will um, substantiate further later. Fifth would be socioeconomic influence, and that's where employment and education comes in. And last but not the least is access to healthcare, so our healthcare delivery system. So I think it's a perfect uh, match between Dr. Labarda talking about concretely these realities that happen because of Typhoon Haiyan in Region 8 and what we're doing right now. So next slide, please. So with all of these factors, we can simply say that health is a multidimensional reality. And all of these must be taken into consideration if we are to genuinely promote people's health. Although it's multidimensional, it's integrated as one. So it essentially calls for an approach that is holistic. Next slide, please. And to make it holistic requires that healthcare should be grounded in social realities. Now earlier, um, the six factors that we have enumerated coming from the DOH speaks of number four factor, which is environment. And number five is socioeconomic okay, factors. And looking at okay, the figure on the screen, ladies and gentlemen, okay, we recognize that all of these are labeled as core determinants of health or social determinants of health. Next slide, please. And these social determinants of health are predictors of how likely, by the way, our health efforts is going to you know, bear fruit in society. So allow me to share with you Kowling in 2014 captured these realities in India when they came up with a study highlighting how the social determinants of health, which includes education, employment, impacts the population. 
So if I may invite everybody once more to look at the map on the screen, where is the Philippines? So we don't even exist. <laughs> Nakakalungkot, no? So, so with this figure coming from, okay, most likely a developed nation, the Philippines isn't even included in the map. <laughs> you know, of course, kidding aside. Now, the purpose why I'm sharing this with everybody is to, uh, it depends, oh, I think it's from China. <laughs> okay, so the purpose why I'm showing everybody the map is to prove that with social determinants comes health disparities. And we talk about health disparities or, you know, difference in health outcomes. Life expectancy, okay, clearly shows that there is social injustice right now when you talk about the realities of health. Why? It's because on the map, okay, where you live will actually predict how long you're going to stay on this earth. <laughs> and if we're going to look at the trend, those countries like the US, okay, countries from Europe actually enjoy a higher life expectancy. They're labeled red on the map. Compared to countries like in Africa, like in what, certain parts of Asia, okay, we're expected to live probably less than, okay, others. And again, this is, okay, rooted in social determinants because why is it that people live longer in these countries? Probably it's because they enjoy better quality of life because they have better health care and others. To simplify, social determinants. So from a global perspective, next slide please, let's now look at how is it in the Philippines? Okay, so earlier this morning, um, we were asked, where are the delegates from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao? So, what reasons do you think has the longest life expectancy in the Philippines? So from the Philippine Statistics Authority, I was trying to look into, do they have the latest figures? But unfortunately, they don't. So what they have is 2010. So what regions actually enjoy longer life expectancy in the Philippines? Oh, let's simplify further. Um, if we're going to think of Cordillera, earlier, you know, we have a friend from UP Baguio sharing about, okay, uh, Baguio and its environment. So the, who do you think, by the way, okay, has better life expectancy? People living in Cordillera or NCR? Cordel? So what, lit, uh, what okay, is your basis for claiming that people from Cordillera are expected to live longer? Uh, no pollution. Less stress. Uh, okay, wala silang EDSA. <laughs> wala, may exercise sila, no? Okay, and that's social determinants of health. But if we're going to look at evidence, what is striking to note is that CAR actually has a shorter life expectancy compared to that of NCR. Uh, uh, kasi malabo yung slides. <laughs> <laughs> Hindi raw mapasa. But if you're going to look and dissect by the way the figure, CAR actually has a lesser life expectancy compared to NCR. And if you're going to compare again NCR with that of ARMM, again, that's a social um, injustice. It's because we're all Filipinos. But where you are right now, okay, predicts how long you're going to live. And this is where health comes in. And this is where disaster risk reduction comes in. Because if we have not reached the consciousness that health is number one, disasters will continue claiming lives. Now, before I move to the next slide, what do you think is the reason why NCR has an edge over regions who, based on your claim, enjoys better environment, lesser stress? It's essentially access. That's why it is... It is crucial that as an academic community, we talk to decision makers and ensure that funding for universal health care should be totally implemented. Next slide, please. <laughs> so, from all of these concepts that we have just um, cited, one thing is certain, health connects us all. So apart from health as a multidimensional reality, it's actually a social reality. In the same manner, understanding that health is a social reality is a perfect fit in understanding disasters. It's because both health and disasters, okay, will actually claim people's lives. Next slide, please. And so, okay, considering that health is a shared reality, okay, let's look at the convergence of health and disasters. So, the DOH, um, through the National Objectives for Health 2016-2022, published two years ago, 
Okay, stated that the Philippines is currently the third country most disaster prone, next to China and next to in terms of the number of disasters. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm seeing again some okay warning signs. Oh, I think I need to stop talking in a few minutes. Pero tuloy pa rin hanggat wala pong guardia na hihila sa akin. <laughs> so lessons from the past. Okay, these numbers are not just mere numbers. They're not just statistics. They mean lives. And this should bother us. It's because we should not let the same number again happen in the next, okay, uh, the next months, in the next years. And this calls for a collective action. And what is a collective action? We need to start talking together, okay, engage stakeholders. But we have to begin with investing in people's health. Next slide, please. Okay, so how does health and disasters interact? So, uh, Martinez in 2015 highlighted, in reason eight, after Typhoon Haiyan, okay, struck, okay, there were an increase in the number of people consulting for asthma, cardiovascular disease. Another, okay, it's a study. Next slide, please. Okay, showing again the connection between health and disasters in which Isidore in 2012 enumerated that communicable diseases, okay, are usually uh, a major problem in disasters because of risk factors like poor sanitation, etc., etc. Next slide, please. So, with all of these, okay, what scenarios do we expect? with disasters and health it would be six Ds. And what are these six Ds? If I'm going to summarize in themes, disasters spell out next, displacement. When people, by the way, are displaced and they're brought to evacuation centers, overcrowding and brings about risk for acute respiratory infection, pneumonia. And we know very well that acute respiratory infection is the number one killer disease among children. Next one, please. Oh, disruption. Okay, we're talking about disruption. I'm not gonna breathe. I have my gills already working for me. Is that disruption in people's lives will also mean disruption in the treatment of chronic illness. Like, okay, for hypertension. If we know the medical access program of the DOH given again to people with hypertension because of disasters, they don't, by the way, have access to this life-saving medicine. And what is the effect? It may bring about hypertensive crisis. It may bring about mortality. Next, please, another day is that deprivation. Children, the most vulnerable. Two minutes. Thank you. The joke <laughs> Deprivation. So children, okay, the most vulnerable, are deprived, by the way, of access to nourishment. Okay, malnutrition again happens. Okay, what else? Okay, deprivation also from access of social services, education, and the like that will affect, by the way, their potential. Next, please. Okay, it also results in destabilization, stress, anxiety, and mental health issues. Anxiety and stress. And I'm actually stress at the very moment trying to sum up in two minutes and actually less than two minutes and of course destruction of infrastructure and that okay will definitely impact water systems and that will okay create the possibility of waterborne diseases now disability brought about by injury so should we be bothered okay when you talk about health as an issue for disaster resilience yes particularly at this very moment in time why it's because Okay, we're currently dealing with outbreaks. Okay, we have measles outbreak and then we have, ano po ngayon, ang problema natin? Polio. And this, by the way, speaks of a vulnerability, a collective vulnerability that in the next few months, if another disaster strikes and our immunity is compromised, and then all the RIM efforts will go to waste. So, again, my agenda at this very moment is simply to mainstream the idea that health should be included in our the RRM efforts. And this begins by using what we call the SDG approach. Next slide, please. Using the set time framework and combining it with primary health care, where I'm actually coming from. And in primary health care, it's essentially making sure that health is in the hands of the people by investing on people, capacity building, so that when you talk about resilience, it's about adaptability. When people by their are capable of doing things on their own, even before help and assistance from external organizations come, they can do it. And it will definitely help us reach that zero casualty that Congressman Salcedo was actually telling us earlier. So with that, thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>